Welcome back. Today, I've got a pretty special build here, something I've been pretty excited to start for a while. Been kind of collecting the uh, parts and pieces and actually waiting for some of those parts to be released. So as you can see here, this is a SCX24 base build, but we're gonna be doing it around this hard body crawler company, FJ40 body. So along with that, I picked up their front and rear bumper set, rear license plate holder, and their very nice uh, wheel set with the fifth wheel spare included. So knowing that this guy is gonna be a hard body, it's got seats, it's gonna have a rear spare, I'm anticipating a very top and rear heavy vehicle. So what you see here is a whole lot of brass to basically keep this guy planted. So I've got uh, a lot of it based around MoFo. So the Servo Beast, the uh, best Servo Man ever, steering links, suspension links, and then I've got his uh, version three front and rear brass axles, and then MoFo 20% underdrive. And then the rest of the build is gonna be infilled kind of as you see here. I've got the hot racing oil shocks. I've got the trio heavyweight brass knuckles. And then I've got this uh, Komodo and mount and 15 tooth pinion that I wasn't able to use on another build. So I'm hoping to be able to squeeze that in here. But of course, there may be some discovery on this since it's a new kind of body. We'll just have to see what fits. And then uh, just a stock transmission. And then we've got a Fury Tech Ultimate and a uh, FS2A four channel micro receiver. So that ultimate will be able to push this uh, servo beast up to 8.4. So hopefully we can squeeze a 3S in that. And that's part of the reason I've got this Bauhaus LCG kit to actually drop that battery tray and actually give us a little more headroom potentially for a thicker 3S. So anyways, that's kind of the overview of what we're going to be doing. So I think first off, I'm going to try to build up kind of a chassis and then we'll have something to see uh, what this body fitment looks like, what the motor fitment looks like. So let's jump into this guy, see what we can't get done. Before we get started, I figured this would be the best time to kind of go over the parts and pieces included in this kit. And as you can see here, you get quite a bit with this hard body crawler company FJ40 kit. Lots of detail here. And unlike a traditional plastic model kit, there is no sprue to cut the parts loose from. They're all pre-cut, pre-bagged, pre-molded in the color, or pre-painted. So basically, you could just assemble this and have a really nice looking FJ. So we've got detail parts, the main body parts, interior. We've got the grill, inner fenders, very nice instruction manual. And one of my favorite things is the pre-painted window trim on the clear glazing. So that's super nice. And then of course, we've got a bag of hardware here. So. This should be no problem assembling it, but what's really nice is that if you want to take this to the next level, they offer some scale accessories to really trick this out as a traditional FJ40. So as you saw, I picked some of those up, so let's take a closer look at some of those accessories for this guy. Okay, let's check out these accessories, and man, this packaging is just outstanding. They just nailed it. Even the cardboard box this comes in is branded just like this. It is super nice. So inside, well packaged, presented. So you get your front bumper, little tow hooks, mounts. We've got our wheel set and hub tool. And we've got this uh, rear bumper, little bumperettes, rear tail lights. And then I picked up a little rear license plate holder and lights. And I believe they even offer a front holder that I may need to pick up. But like I was saying, these instructions are a rarity in the uh, SCX24 world. So that is super nice and super detailed. So just incredible attention to detail with this brand overall. So I'm very excited to jump into this kit and get it assembled. And uh, we'll take a look at these wheels and all this uh, as we get a little further and get it assembled onto the vehicle. Okay, first thing we're gonna need to get started for this uh, FJ40 kit is some chassis rails. So this is designed around the C10 JLU length uh, 
chassis and links. So this is a JLU basically set up right here, the rear and front uh, ESC tray and body post mounts. So that's ready to go. And then uh, the one thing I don't have here is uh, any bearings. So I've got this deadbolt or half of a deadbolt here with a full new front axle. So that's gonna be the donor for the bearings and the worm gears. So we're gonna get this thing built up. We're not gonna need the inner axles because I'm gonna use these MoFo V2 CVD axles. Um, but doing that with these heavyweight trail knuckles, I'm gonna have to go ahead and get the Dremel and clearance out this upper pocket for the uh, lower shock hardware. They, they provide kind of a little cutout. It's just really not deep enough when you go to CVDs and you want that extra steering throw. So that'll be a quick little mod there, but we should get this axle set up and uh, hopefully have no problems with it. All right, got this front axle pretty much uh, done here. So a couple notes, got this thing uh, nice and free spinning here, super smooth. Used only one O-ring on the uh, worm gear with this brass axle. Um, you can see I fitted up my uh, shock here to kind of test fit and it turns out it doesn't look like these shocks have the clearance issue. So the trail shocks did actually run into the knuckle, but these look like they are clearing that hardware and I'm right sitting on the diff. So in actually turning this, it looks like I'm smooth and I get to kind of a can kind of feel a point here right there it's kind of at the extreme so I think I'm going to actually adjust these axles or the turning probably just off of that diff and it seems to be just nice and smooth right here so I'm clear without having to modify the knuckles which is nice um, one thing I did have to do on these knuckles um, one of them the inner bearing, I could not get it to seat. So uh, good trick for that is I just rolled up uh, some sandpaper really tightly, put in that bearing uh, seat and just kind of rolled it for a little bit to, to just take a little off and then that dropped in. And then I could not get either knuckle to slide on the CVD and the uh, kind of the end of the axle, the C-arm without popping out this outer bearing. If that outer bearing was in there, it was just too tight of a tolerance. So that had to come out, then it popped right on, and then you can slide the bearing in. But uh, other than that, went together smoothly. And you can see the one piece I'm missing is the servo tray. Now that is a little bit of a hiccup here. So running this before, it looks like uh, the tab on the brass axle is a little bit too wide. For this to seat so it won't go down on there so what i've done in the past is just take a dremel uh, kind of cut off sanding wheel and run it on both sides on that inner kind of slot and just widen that out just a hair and it'll drop on there so i'm going to do a little tweak there and that should be uh, the end of kind of the front axle and then we'll uh, we'll move on from there i must say that is one heavily branded mofo front axle so I finally got this servo tray to seat down on the brass axle. Took quite a bit of Dremel work and I'll show a few uh, photos of that. But I had to do uh, quite a bit of uh, clearancing on the saddle with kind of a sanding wheel to get the tray to actually sit down low enough to get these holes to align. Um, just kept having problems with the screws going in and having about an eighth inch uh, maybe left and they would bind and they wouldn't want to go into this back piece so you know I probably had this on and off eight or ten times but when it's metal on metal just you know go slow go by hand and stop if there's any kind of resistance and investigate but I uh, got it worked out so now I'm gonna have to pull it back off get the servo mounting tabs on there and I believe for this servo beast, if I remember from my recent install, it was a JLU and I had to put them on the center uh, two posts to move that servo back a little bit, put the drag link on the front of the uh, servo arm just to be able to kind of clear the uh, bumper 
mounts on each side of the frame. So I'm gonna start there with this one. But before we get this guy mounted up, let's take a uh, close look at it. So it's just beautiful, very nice. And I believe he's coming out with a uh, polished case version for the next ones. I think this is still the matte finish, but uh, this is number 54 out of the original 100. So let's take a look at the specs, just incredible at 8.4 volts, which we will be running this at, so 158 ounce inches. So I'm sure way more overkill uh, than this vehicle needs, but really a lot of what I got this for was uh, the 44 something gram weight of this and the horn. And uh, that's really what I want on this axle, just to really keep that front end planted. So anyways, I think this is going to be a great option for adding some weight and it's going to bring some speed and power as well. So I'm going to get this tray back off, get this installed, and then we can move on to the rear axle. Quick installation tip on these adjustable servo trays. So when I install the servos onto these, since these posts are uh, removable, um, I usually leave them loose and you can see there's some play, there's a little bit of wiggle there. And uh, that way you can tighten down the servo and that will snug these up and get them aligned perpendicular to the back of this. Because if you snug these down first, there's a chance you might have them a little cockeyed and it won't line up with these long screws. So, you know, I always come back and tighten these guys down last. And then once you do that, you can take the servo on and off because you've got these guys locked into place. But just a little tip there that may help you uh, get this installed a little bit easier. Back with this servo snugged up on the tray here. And uh, you can see I did mount the drag link to the front of the servo horn. Just was not enough space with this thickened brass diff cover on there. I think without that, you'd be able to mount it kind of in the traditional way behind the servo horn. But uh, that's really due to having to move this back to the middle position on that servo mount tray. But I think uh, for now, we've got this front axle wrapped up and uh, I've just got a rubber band on there to kind of train the cord to hopefully not hit the frame. Uh, we'll see. But man, I can barely hold that with my fingers. That is so heavy. Uh, we'll get that on the scales here in a minute when we get the rear axle built up. But speaking of rear axle, we've got Mofos 20% underdrive. And then I gutted uh, the rear axle of the deadbolt. I'd already stolen the housing, so these are the guts. We're not going to use the OEM gears. So I'm going to throw this together and... Uh, We'll get these on the scales and see what these guys weigh. All right, got this rear axle assembly completed here. And of course it was much smoother than the front because there's no knuckles, none of that geometry to deal with. Always a lot easier. So I ended up with two O-rings on that worm gear and there's just a hair bit of play in and out, but just buttery smooth. Of course with some utter butter in there as well, but uh, just perfect. The only issue I had on assembly was this link riser. And again, this brass axle housing had that similar issue that I dealt with with the uh, servo tray. So I guess these mounting tabs or those top holes are just a little off. So I took a pin vise and actually uh, made each top hole a little bit bigger all the way through. And then when I was kind of easing both of these long screws down kind of equally, I really had to put a lot of pressure on this link riser at the rear just to make sure that they would bite and then thread into this kind of rear piece that captures the screw. Um, I don't know if you would have been able to get an aluminum mount to uh, work on this. I mean, it was, it was a little bit of fiddling to get this guy on and this is the flexible plastic, but it seems to be working just perfectly. Couldn't be happier with the uh, function. So now that both are assembled, we'll throw them on the scales and see what these guys weigh. Time for a quick weight check on these axle assemblies. So we'll get the rear on here. Looks like we're gonna settle in at 44 grams. We'll get this front assembly on. 145.2, so that's just incredible. So we are starting out with a lot of great unsprung weight for this build. A lot of front bias. I think that's going to work to our advantage since this is a hard body and it has a spare and a full interior on it. It's really going to need to stay planted. So I think this is really going to help overall. 
All right, I think it's about time for final chassis assembly so we can start getting this thing mocked up. So I've got all the components laid out here. Went ahead and got some 30 weight oil in these hot racing shocks. And man, I really, uh, really like these shocks. I've used these several times. Nice, smooth, slow rebound there. So I went ahead and left the silver medium springs in those anticipating a heavier body. It comes with the black soft and the gold firms. And then the other component here on the table I haven't really talked about is the Bauhaus LCG kit. So it's basically two pieces here and it's set up very nicely to work with the stock 030 can motor. Um, it's not set up very well for brushless motors and since we're going to be using this forward mount uh, brushless we're going to have to chop up most of this ESC tray space so I'm going to save this guy and we're going to just install this battery tray here so if you notice there's no rear leg so this thing slots into the frame at the rear location so it drops this down similar to the gladiator battery tray sits it in the frame rails so it gains you about five millimeters of uh, height there it lowers it down about five millimeters so that should give us a little more space for a thicker battery and just drop that battery down overall so I think I'm going to go ahead and start getting this mocked up so we'll have a chassis. The one thing I don't have is a correct uh, rear male stub. You can see I've got a front one on here. Um, I should have one arriving shortly, but we can go ahead and mock up with this uh, incorrect one on there for now. So I'll be back in a second and we ought to have a chassis. Quick public service announcement here. So uh, when you mesh up your gears, you wanna make sure and have a little bit of wiggle room. So you can move that spur without moving the motor pinion or vice versa. But that looks to be a nice mesh right there. And we'll test that here in a little bit, but uh, never want that mesh to be too tight. All right, we've got a, a symbol chassis, nice smooth action everywhere. So a few notes on this assembly. Um, I had to clearance the front shroud on the uh, drive shaft for this lower link to uh, move freely. That's pretty common. I'll show a little picture of that. And then on the rear axle, I had to widen out one of the link connections just a little bit to slip it in. The other one I didn't. The front slipped in just fine, so I don't know what the deal was. On the, uh, the front servo, I'm getting full side to side, very smooth, and I went ahead and clearanced this uh, frame as well. But if I come straight down the middle, I can get all the way down, but I've got to start putting a lot of pressure right about here to do it. And that's because the front edge of this tray is actually coming into contact with that servo cord you can see it pushing it down there. So it's not a huge clearance issue, but it's something I probably want to uh, rectify. So I may clearance out that tray, um, especially if I move these shocks up and try to lower this whole vehicle down and have the servo sitting here, it's gonna compress further. So that may be a reality. Um, and then the last thing you'll notice, I don't have the battery tray in. So when I was about to fit this in here, I'll line it up for the screw holes and it's basically uh, it sits flush here so that is lined up right there where it wants to sit so it wants to hit the case so I've already moved the pinion all the way inward that I can so the pinion sticks out so does the stub and then the two button heads so because this tray now sits down here at the frame it's lower than that pinion so that rotating pinion is going to be sticking out of the case at the battery end so i don't really like that i don't mind cutting up the tray a little to fit it in but i really don't like this piece spinning sticking out so that has led me to look at some other options so this vehicle may end up getting a mofo power plant and that may actually benefit the build overall um, from mocking this up it looks like the height is about the same this little tip here is a little bit higher since the Komodo is fully rounded. Um, this is a smaller diameter and much lighter. And I'll, uh, I'll weigh each of these here in a minute and see what the difference is. But 
This should save a lot of weight, some space. This is much thinner. And the big thing is when this is actually mounted, barely coming through and that's just the end, not the actual gear pinion. So that is not a big concern to me. So I think this may be the way. So we're gonna do a little more tweaking to this chassis and I'll come back and then maybe we'll have the version we're gonna move forward with. All right, I may have found a good solution for that servo height clearance. So on the bottom is a deadbolt chassis and on the top is a uh, Gladiator chassis. So the Gladiator shares the same ESC tray as the JLU and you can see there it sits right above the frame and the shock mount is in front of the body post. This one is exactly the same on the deadbolt, except the shock sits behind the body post and the tray is actually elevated up off of that frame, maybe four millimeters, three or four millimeters. So it's got much uh, more clearance underneath this front edge right there. So I think uh, because I've got to, you know, swap out this motor, I can recut a tray that's a little bit longer because I won't need all this clearance. So I may as well use this uh, deadbolt tray that's a little bit taller and uh, the body post mount is in the same position. So that shouldn't affect the build at all or the uh, body fitment. So that may be a good solution here to get a little more up travel with that big old servo up there. So just wanted to point that out, handy little swap out. I don't know if a lot of people realize that, that those trays are just a little different on the deadbolt than the JLU. Okay, before we get these on the scales, I just wanted to size them up here. See if I can get these squared up to the camera. So you can see the height difference here in the uh, ROP versus the Komodo. So it's a little bit shorter. If I can get it a little bit better here. The mount's actually about the same. This high tip is about the same as this high point, but this is a smaller diameter motor, so it's a little bit lower. And then let's look at these from the side. So definitely some depth difference there. Skinnier mount and uh, skinnier motor as well. So we'll get these on the scales and see actually what the weight difference is with the motors and the mounts. All right, time to see what the two motor and mount options weigh in at. So I can get this all on there with the cable. So almost double with the Fury Tech system. So this is gonna be a pretty good weight savings. Um, definitely gonna lower the center of gravity being that both of these motors mount at the same height. And there's gonna be a lot less weight up in the air with this guy. And since that is sprung weight, I think, again, that's really going to benefit this build that we're trying to kind of fight that with the unsprung weight. So happy little accident. Going to go ahead and get this uh, ROP installed. So here we are with the uh, 2.0 chassis setup, if you will. So we got the ROP motor installed here, obviously. And then I've got the deadbolt tray freshly trimmed up to allow a sliver of clearance here to the motor. And you can see I was able to keep all four legs on that, which is very nice. Usually you've got to make that a three-legged dog. So the other nice thing is actually the usable kind of real estate right here to actually mount something. With that Komodo, that was basically wasted space, anything that was left over. So that's kind of nice. So moving forward, instead of using the, uh, the deadbolt kind of shock mount position, which is now on the back side, I initially did, and it gave me a little bit of a lean on the shock, which I liked. But I realized I could still get a little lean to the shock and get it uh, actually lower the chassis if I was able to mount them in the body mount post location. So I moved them and that was able to drop everything down and allow that servo to get much deeper. So I ended up having to take out the cross brace as well for that ESC tray. But now I've got full unrestricted travel, um, no issues. The one thing I did have to do was clearance out both sides of the frame rail, top and bottom, quite a bit more. Um, so basically they're just flat rails where the servo and the tray occur. To allow that tray to get right there within the frame rails and the servo is fully above it now. So this thing will be sitting nice and low at full compression 
So the front end I'm very happy with. The uh, Moving down the line here, I guess the battery tray was next. You can see I did chop about three millimeters, I guess, off the front of that to actually get it installed and clear those screw heads. But uh, because of the screw heads sticking out and the fact that that shaft barely protrudes, there's not going to be any issue with the battery uh, butting up against anything moving there. So that's working out well. So I thought I had that uh, licked. So moving to the back suspension, I ended up swapping in these aluminum hot racing adjustable mounts. So they're not super great, but they do allow you to move the shock a little bit higher for the top point, and they give you a little bit of options to lean. But you can see the original shock point, there wasn't much lean. I, I was able to drop everything a little, but moving the shock point back, I was able to drop it more, get a little more lean, better articulation, and because these are flex blades, it gives me a little more dropout. So always nice to have some little things like this on hand just in case you need it um, for kind of tweaking setups here but i think i'm pretty happy with this looking at the full compression and speaking of that full compression in the rear what that did now was allow me to get so far up in the frame with the uh, diff and the links that i had to actually come back here and clearance out the underside of the uh, battery tray and the end of it for these basically the hardware heads and the link ends on the diff. You can see I'm right up there within it, actually to the tray. So I'll show a better shot of the underside of that. But now I'm getting full action out of the rear suspension. So I'm pretty happy. I think everything's functioning well, very smooth, um, no collisions, no binding. So I think with this setup, we're ready to move forward. Um, and we may tweak this as we go, depending on you know body fitment, overall setup, and, and whatnot. But I think for now, as a chassis, I think we're good to go. Okay, now that we've got kind of the version two chassis set up here and the motor installed, I think it's time for a little motor test. So I've got all the electronics here laid out on the table. This is the usual suspects for me, at least on the last few builds. Some of my favorite items here. So of course, I'm gonna be using the trusty FlySky FS GT5 radio. So I need a compatible receiver, so I've got the FS2A4 channel, little micro receiver from Amazon. So this guy is a super small footprint, almost weighs nothing. Big fan of this guy. And then I've got it sitting on a little uh, styrene black plastic uh, mount from Rockwolf Designs. So that'll take care of the radio receiver. For the ESC, I've got Fury Tech's currently top of the line uh, ESC, the ultimate. So this guy, again, I'm a big fan of that, and that is basically due to its incredible specs here. So we'll take a quick look. So you can see that constant current of 40 amp and a burst of 70, which is great. And then the BEC is selectable up to 8.4 volts at three amps. So plenty of power for the servo beast, which we will need. And since we'll be running that at 8.4 volts, I've got this 3S battery. So this is an E-Flight 450 milliamp hour. So it's almost twice as thick as stock, not quite, same footprint. So that is the main reason that I wanted to get this LCG battery tray in there to give me a little more headroom for that thicker battery. And then the last thing we'll need, if you're using a 3S, you're most likely gonna need a little uh, adapter cable and you can get these in multi-packs pretty cheap on Amazon as well. So with that said, I think it's time to plug this stuff up and give it a quick test. Time for a little testing. I'm going to get the radio on here, get the ESC on. Now I've already set my uh, dual rates, turn those down, and then I've set my endpoints on that servo just visually. So the steering link is standing off the face of the diff cover just a little bit at full lock. And I don't think the knuckles are coming in contact with the uh, lower shock mount hardware. But again, that's just visual. I don't have any uh, binding, you know, any kind of feedback like that, and I won't until I get the drive shafts in there, but it looks good for now. So let's uh, turn our attention here to this uh, Revenge of Pancake. So with this, again, I've adjusted a little bit in the app. The uh, punch I've taken down from the default three to one. So we are in just kind of the slow percentage right here, and I've pumped that up to 35%. The issue I was having is the transition from slow to fast. 
So there it was right there. So that's what it was at punch turned down to one. So it's a lot smoother transition going from that slow to the faster. And you just get faster and faster. This is about half throttle. That's not even full throttle. This thing is just so fast, probably way overkill, but it definitely fit the uh, size needed for this build. And man, it's a pretty motor. Look at that, super silent. So looks like everything's working. So I'm gonna get those drive shafts installed and then I wanna do one more quick turning test to make sure that we're all good on these front CVDs. Well, this is why we do testing. So you can see here, I've pulled out these CVD axles. So when I was testing uh, with the drive shafts connected at full lock, basically on my passenger side, the knuckle was wanting to basically hop. It was just bouncing on the table. So I just pulled everything apart, uh, pulled the knuckles off, investigated those, the axles. Um, and it turns out that one of these at full lock when you twist it, there's just all kinds of bucking. And then even when I installed it and was holding those so they were straight, um, the collar was still rotating off center. So there's some misalignment, some defect, I think, with the actual joint in there. And this one is just smooth as butter. Um, so luckily I had some OGRC uh, CVDs or really their universal joints on hand for another build. So I swapped those in and uh, those guys, you really have to be careful. They can fold to 90 degrees, but they'll, of course, they're going to bind. They can only work at the same basic angle as a CVD. They can't go any further um, and spin, but if you don't have the knuckle on, they can just flop at a 90. So you've got to be very careful to get these adjusted correctly. But it looks like I've got these at their max. No hopping. It's still not even top speed for that motor. It's just insane. And one other thing I did after I got it adjusted and, and knew it was all good, I've got this now cranked up to 8.4 volts, so quite a bit faster. Uh, just before we had it just on the uh, lowest on five, but. Uh, Looks like everything is now functioning, so glad I got these uh, axles worked out and uh, just have to toss this one. Um, unfortunately, MoFo's sold out of these right now, so I think I'll be ordering another set of these OGRCs for that build that I stole these off of. But uh, I think for now, we are safe to move forward. On to the fun stuff. So a little bit of time has passed for me, none for you, but in that time, I've gotten all the parts and pieces painted, the body detailed up, panel lined, and I've got the flat clear coat sealing in that panel liner. And I think that looks really, really sharp. Really happy with it. So it's just kind of mocked up right there so I could get a nice even flat coat over the body shell. And then you can see the interior is painted. Basically every part got painted except for the clear lenses. I was able to pull the lenses off of the side markers to paint those side markers. These uh, side door handles also will pull off so you can paint those separately. And then just had to uh, use some fine brushes to pick up kind of the hinge details and uh, keyholes, things like that. But overall, not too hard at all. Take you through the process here. So I use this fine surface primer in gray I used to me as AS11, this medium sea gray, and of course flat clear at the end. And then I use their TS99 for the interior and TS82 for all the black trim, kind of underbody. And then the black it out detailing liquid for the panel liner. And then flat aluminum and flat black just for the details on the body. But nothing to it really, just a little bit of patience and a uh, little imagination and you can have yourself a pretty unique looking FJ. So a few notes thus far into this. 
So I would say check your parts right out of the gate because I ended up with two of the same side mirrors. So I had to contact the company. They don't sell replacement parts or have them, so they just sent me a whole new kit. So I definitely will be building another one of these. Another note is uh, this roof panel. When you're putting the screws into that roof panel, they go up. They're a little bit long. I had seen that on some other YouTube uh, videos and you can over tighten those and actually poke them through the roof or dimple them. So I ended up snipping all those screws short just to make sure that wouldn't happen. I'll show a shot of that. But as you can see, no dimpling. That roof is nice and smooth. And uh, the other note was uh, part of the reason it's been a little while for me was I was waiting on some parts here. So you can see here, here's the grill. Since this is unlicensed, it is blank. So I contacted my buddy Brandon over at Grizzly Works and asked him if he would design up a Toyota grill for this thing. So he happily obliged and he also surprised me with a uh, safari snorkel. So got quite a few of these grills, snorkels, and like I say, I've got a whole extra body. So I don't know if the snorkel's going on this one, but it's probably going to go on the next one, if not this one. But uh, that's all the notes thus far. So I think I'm going to get a little further into this body assembly and we'll see where we are. Back with a little update here. So I went ahead and added a little more detail to this uh, dashboard the buttons and kind of the got the stickers on there and everything. I think that looks really nice. And the grill assembly is ready to go as well. Looking killer. Just needs some uh, LEDs in there. And then uh, the body, the notes I'd say on the body is don't assemble it in the order they tell you. Um, you should have the interior in by the time you do the windows according to them, but I found it much easier to be able to get fingers back behind here so leave the interior out um, and then the other note on the windows these curved ones I got to clip in easily the flat ones on the back and the sides could not get those in um, ended up taking an exacto and shaving off a little height on these tension clips on the top and bottom probably half or more because there's really no flex in this clear plastic so Shaving those clips down, I was able to get those to pop in there, but just, you know, don't force it and break the window. Just shave it down, modify it a little bit to get it to fit. Everything on this was a tight fit. Um, same with these jump seats. They've got the tension clips. They were super hard to press in there. Um, I would leave the cushions off and then you can flex kind of the thinner black piece and get it in there. And then you can put this bottom cushion on and kind of flatten it. But, uh, other than everything being an extremely tight fit and then probably a little tighter because I painted everything. Um, other than that, everything went together easily. I've got all those sub components kind of ready to go. So I think I'm going to move forward, get the interior in and uh, get a little more assembly done here. Now that's what I call progress right there. So as you can see, the final assembly is done. Everything went together without a hitch. The only little notes here um, again, just super tight fit on the blinkers and the mirrors and the wipers. So I shaved off the posts a little bit exacto on both of these to get those to slide in a little easier. And then I used uh, a little bit of shoe goo on all three elements to make sure those didn't pop out. But I think that's looking just super clean, really nice. So the next thing was going ahead and starting to get it onto the frame. So there's two ways to get it on there. There's a hinge in the back and it can angle forward or it can angle backwards. So for the JLU, it angles forward and you can see it's, it's angling forward right there. And that basically puts the axles in the correct spot for the fenders. So with the deadbolt, you would want to shift the body back. That's why this angles back. But uh, you can see here it's set up for this JLU the hiccup I ran into is uh, the front end here and you can see I've got my shocks off everything's kind of apart there and that's because this will not close down and initially I was kind of rubbing my shocks you can see a little paint here off of that inner fender I think I was hitting the reservoir but uh, 
with this fully seated, I think it's going to block this upper mount. So I may have to come back and clearance out these inner fenders a little bit, but I think I'm going to definitely have to drill some new holes. Uh, I think I'm hitting about right where my thumb is with the body post right now. So a little bit in front of these rear holes. So I think the front holes are for the deadbolt. So if you had the thing shifted back and then the JLU maybe should be hitting these. Um, don't quote me on that, but really doesn't matter because I'm not hitting either one of them with this kind of hybrid setup with the deadbolt tray up front. So I think the next thing is going to be getting the body to fully seat so I can pin it. And then I'll take a look at the shocks and kind of the inner fender and what needs to happen there. Okay, that seemed to do the trick. Got the body sitting nice and low. Got my pegs coming through the mount so I can actually pin it closed, but I'm happy with that. So super easy, I just measured, marked, and used a little mini drill press and my Dremel to pop those holes, but they uh, somehow seem to be perfectly aligned here. So let me pull it off, drop it, boom. Can't be happier with that. So now everything is nice, level, and low. So let's take a look here at this inner fender that's still on the vehicle. So it does come down and cover that upper body post mount basically. So if I want to use that for a shock mount, I'm going to have to clearance these. And then you can see that rear mount is really close. So I think I may just open up these inner fenders a little bit more to give those shocks a little more breathing room, but I don't think that'll be too hard and get this front end put back together. And then that should uh, basically finish us up here with the body except for all the remaining little add-on goodies that we still have to put in. I've got the fenders modified as you saw and reinstalled and I'm sitting nice and level with the frame now. I've got plenty of clearance there around the top of the shock and the reservoir on each side so no problem there. Fully closing and I've actually got body pins in there so very happy with that. But you can see overall we're sitting level on the chassis but suspension wise we're leaning to the rear and there's a little there's a little sag on the rear springs not much but i think it's just these are mounted maybe higher uh, that's why it's sitting a little bit lower so these being in the body mount post positions are the highest i can get the shock so the only way to drop the nose is to put in some softer springs or Depending with the spare and whatnot, if this sags more, this kit does come with some firm springs. And I believe, I believe these silvers are mediums maybe. The golds may be the firmest in these little hot racing. So I think I've got some options to play with spring rates to level it out. But I don't think there's any sense to that until I get the weight of the spare on there and all the wheels. So that's gonna come probably towards the end. But I think now with basically the full kit assembled and working, I think we're going to focus on assembling these uh, front and rear bumper sets. Let's take a quick look at the front bumper components here. So as you can see, I went ahead and did a little more painting on that front bumper. It comes a flat kind of aluminum silver color. So I went ahead and matched it with the rubber black that I'm using everywhere else on the build for the trim. So I think that'll look really good, at least initially. I'm sure that'll scratch off over time, but it's going to be nice and blacked out on the front end to start with. So. As far as the uh, instructions on the kit, I only found one little error. It was really just in the parts list. So they've got these labeled wrong. So obviously that's the SCX24 extension. That's not. Other than that, it's all correct. Further down in the exploded diagrams, they show them correctly. So it's not a big deal. Um, so this is the Galande kind of leftover that you're not gonna use. And then setting this up for the C10 Bronco or JLU, you're going to use the extension brackets if you're doing this on a deadbolt build the whole body shifted back so you don't need these you'll just use the main bumper brackets here so i'm going to go ahead and assemble this we'll see what it looks like and then we'll take a look at that rear bumper well definitely not going to win any awards on approach angle but uh, definitely is scale accurate so i think that looks really good especially uh, blacked out now and as you notice, I used uh, black hardware. I just swapped all that out. So the whole front end is nice and blacked out. So uh, super happy with that. Definitely uh, 
definitely not going to be a performance rock crawler bumper, but I don't think it's going to be as bad as it looks because, uh, you know, looking at this, that's horrible. But once you get a tire on there and depending on the size of the tire and the width, then you're looking at more something like that for an approach angle, maybe. Um, it, it is worse than it would have been. It probably would have been the leading edge of the tire, which is always awesome to have. But uh, I don't think it's going to be as bad as it looks. But uh, I think now let's turn our attention here to the rear and let's get out the rear bumper and take a look at those components. Quick shot of the rear bumper components. So you do get some nice uh, pre-painted uh, tail light lenses and then some nice stainless uh, steel bumperettes and then a nice steel, uh, I guess this would be your hitch, your drop down hitch. And then this is actually a nice metal bumper here. So pretty self-explanatory. They give you machine screws and they give you some uh, coarse threads. So the coarse thread are gonna bite the plastic and then uh, the rest of it is the machine screws. So we're gonna get this assembled and get it on. Oh man, that looks really, really good. Super scale. That stainless looks really good on there. The only thing that uh, I see is a potential issue. It seemed like the coarse threaded screws going into the plastic probably could have been larger diameter. Um, just hoping that bumper is on there good enough. It doesn't catch and pull off. It seems to be fine, you know, of course, but you never know. I feel like I would rather have it really, really grip in that plastic, but overall just super happy with the look of it. And it's definitely, uh, it's not going to really affect any departure, I guess just a little bit with the bumperettes and the drop down piece, but not bad at all overall. So anyways, I think we are done with the rear bumper accessory. So I think it's just about time for wheels and tires. So I've got my first set here laid out on the table. You can see I've got one of these wheels partially disassembled. So. What's really kind of neat about this wheel set is they give you an option to set these up for a different style. So you can actually remove this center kind of silver moon cap on all of the wheels. They bolt on from the rear here and they give you uh, micro nuts and a driver so you can uh, you know, back those up once you've got that removed. And then they sell an uh, alternate set of locking hubs and I guess you know just regular hubs for the rears. They go in there and they give you a totally different wheel look. I believe that's what's pictured on here. Yeah, so there's no moon cap. You get a deeper dish wheel and you get a really uh, pretty deep looking hub there that sticks out. So kind of a nice option there if you want a couple different looks, but I don't have those extra hubs. I'm gonna run the moon uh, center hub setup. So you've got this kind of funky looking tool that engages kind of the black slots to twist that out. So kind of nice, it covers up the wheel nut, gives you a nice scale look. And for tires, I've got uh, these Yeah Racing Claws. And I've had these for a while and, and I've tried to run them on some builds. I just haven't found a, a build they look really good on. Uh, I really like the tire tread style. These are like Neato Mud Grappler clones. And uh, of course, DJ Crawler makes a much larger version. And then Injura as well makes one these i think these are around 60s so this is a much smaller tire it's uh, around maybe a 51 52 and uh, fairly narrow so i figured that would fit kind of the scale look of this uh, fj40 really nicely so these uh, tires the rubber is not the floppiest um, it's not the gummiest doesn't feel bad but it's definitely not sticky and it's uh, just from the profile it's got some stiffness here overall i think just the pattern and the profile so the foams that come with this are actually really pretty soft but you can see they're just super super narrow so i've gone ahead and swapped in a half of a crawler innovation soft foam in this one and of course these wheels are not vented but uh, i think with the weight of this truck this i think this is going to work pretty well so um Gives it a little more firmness, but it's still soft. It fills out that tire a little more because of the width, and I think it'll probably help with uh, side hill, side roll, because I've got more width um, compressed in there. So I've got a medium here. I still need to chop in half to do the rears, and uh, hopefully that will work out well for the weight and this uh, kind of tire compound. 
So I'm gonna get the rest of this set mounted up and we'll see what these look like. All right, got these OEM style accessory wheels on here and man, I think those look super good. Just make this thing look really classic. They tuck in nicely. There's no axle extensions, so it just is where the wheel puts it. There's a little toe out on the front, which is great, but uh, these are just gonna tuck right in, get stuffed. So that's really nice. And now with that spare on the back, you can see quite a bit more weight here. And that's kind of the, uh, the full extension with the flex blade. So I'm definitely gonna have to look at a limiter there to keep that body from popping up on a descent because of those flex blades. But because of the flex blades, I'm gonna get a lot more travel, a lot more articulation there, so that's nice. Um, and then let's look here at the final kind of approach angle. So it, it really is not that bad. I believe these ended up being, I looked them up, I think these are 53s. So not bad at the front and of course the rear is even probably better there. Let me flip it to the other side without the tire. So it's really good at the uh, kind of the edge. And then if you take into account the bumperette on the back, it's probably matching the front approach angle. So not too bad at all. But overall, I think they look really good, really nice and classic. The only question in my mind still is the color of the wheels. And it's always been kind of odd to me, like it's a kind of a metallic brown. So I had a lot of different kind of options for this FJ for colors. And I went through, you know, kind of a lot, a test sprayed and, you know, sitting the rims next to them, trying to see if they worked well. And this is kind of the one I landed on for the color combo. And I think it looks all right, but I would really love it if they made these style wheels in black or gray or just silver, just something that you could match with basically any color, but I don't think they look too bad. Um, I'm really liking the wheel tire combo and the fitment overall. I think that looks really good and you just can't beat that full size matching spare. So I think that came out really, really good. And looking at this uh, rear sag here, which has exacerbated more by the spare tire, got me thinking, Oh yeah, I don't have the electronics in there yet even, or the battery. So there's even gonna be some more weight. So I think we may take a little break from wheels and tires and uh, finishing out the accessories on the body and go ahead and get the electronics installed. That way we can get kind of an overall and maybe adjust this rear uh, suspension here with all that weight in there. And then we'll finish it out with the, the final touches. I've got the electronics mounted up, tested. Got the lighting in, um, everything is working great. Everything found a home. And I will say it was a bit of a challenge trying to figure out where to mount, being that this build has no side tray kind of sliders here coming off the frame to actually use. So everything had to kind of find a home somewhere within the frame rails. And uh, I ultimately, I think I found a pretty elegant solution and I'll uh, kind of take you through the install process real quick through some photos. So as you saw, everything found a home, even without the uh, presence of any side trays or sliders to mount on. And uh, you saw the ultimate solution was to take advantage of all this space up front because the body sits so high 
there's just this cavity of space up front in the hood. And so I ended up double siding the receiver to the top of the ESC to the top of the ESC tray. So just kind of front loaded this whole thing, just kind of stacked it all here in front of the motor. But it ultimately ended up working out really well, keeping everything between the frame rails. And that was really a necessity just because of the way the, the body drops down underneath because of the interior. And I, I'll pull this off, take a quick peek under, but you can see there, you've got to keep everything kind of narrow to the frame until basically back to the transmission and it opens up. But uh, ended up working out really well. You can see the lights are in there, kind of snaked in and a little coil here. So quick release plug at the rear. And then one other thing I did was uh, actually remount this bumper. So you can see I used some SCX24 hardware and micro nuts and a little Loctite. So I'm much happier with this, you know, through bolt connection now for the bumper. I think that's going to be more than sufficient. So the other thing that you may have noticed with a keen eye is the motor changed color. So no, I didn't paint it. This is Mofo RC's SMP, his slow motion pancake. So this is the same size weight, uh, fitment and everything as the purple ROP. This is just half the KV. So this is 1700 KV rather than 3400. I think this will be a lot more appropriate for the overall build. I don't need all of that speed from the purple one. And I've got another build coming up that I have to have that ROP motor in. And since it is sold out currently, I went ahead and just swapped in one of these guys, which I think will be perfect. So that's basically the electronics, you know, just worked out super well. Once I, once I kind of landed on the solution, you can see all the zip ties there, keeping all that snug. And one really nice thing about this uh, battery tray, you know, it's, it's LCG, but it's also cut out for the motor because it's dropped. So because the motor isn't placed back here, there's just a ton of space to stuff like the balance cord. I can route the battery cable underneath, just a lot of space there to kind of keep all this stuff crammed in, which is nice. So that just worked out really well. You can see I've got an aftermarket battery strap. It's pretty fluffy um, and I haven't screwed this on yet. I think it will close. If not, I may not even need it. If the floor is close enough down to this battery, it's got a lip on the back of the tray. And here's my, you can see my LED extension here. But uh, I think that wraps up electronics and uh, I do have a major sag with the battery in and the body on. so. I think the next order of business is tuning these uh, shocks, swapping the springs and getting a limiter on there as well. And I may have to uh, assess the front as well, but the, the goal is to level this thing out. I don't know if I wanna raise it back up or, or drop it all down or what, but I definitely don't want it sagging to the rear. So we'll see if we can solve this problem. Okay, got the rear springs swapped out. Ended up going with the Hot Racing Gold Firm Springs. They were a little bit longer than the ones that came with the FJ kit. And they seem to be just about the same firmness. But I think that did the trick. This looks pretty dead level from front to back. And of course I did have to use quite a bit of preload with the adjustable collar on this driver's side rear shock. And of course that's for the spare tire just on this side but man i think this thing is looking really good especially now that it's leveled out i also got the center limiter to keep that axle from dropping out with those flex blades on there so let's see if i can uh, swap hands here so before you remember that there was a lot of dropout on the axle so there's just a little bit, just a tad bit of drop out there from the, you know, if I firmed up that rubber band, there would be none. So if I pick up the axle, you know, that's, that's what you're seeing, just a little bit of drop out. But that's way better than what was happening before. It's definitely going to help and I can always adjust that tighter if needed. But uh, I guess the last thing here, obviously I got the body on the hinge, got that attached. 
everything closed and fit perfectly over that battery and strap. The one thing I ran into was a mod that I did to the rear bumper. The uh, through bolts that I put in there and the micro nuts. So you can see now all you see coming through the back is just the micro nuts. I swapped in some much shorter hardware. So when you hinge it open, those longer bolts were hitting basically the bottom of the hinge plate, that plastic piece. So now with the shorter hardware, all of that can hinge open just fine. So I'm really happy with it right now. And honestly, it looks like we're done. And if this were anybody else's build, we probably would be, but got a few little finishing touches and we've got one major thing left. Let's talk alternate wheels and tires. So I've got everything on the table here, you see. We're using uh, the classic stamp steelies from RC Four Wheel Drive. So nothing, uh, nothing new and exciting here. Just uh, tried and true, very affordable. People either love these wheels or hate them. And I love them for the fact that they're affordable. You can flip the hub and make them deep dish. Um, just classic look with that wagon wheel spoke. And they come in, I think, four colors now. The downside is they're fairly light with this aluminum ring. There's no brass on this wheel at all. So if you remember, the stock aluminum FJ wheels were like 19.6 grams a piece. So pretty heavy for aluminum. So to counter that and kind of equal out these alternates, I've got another old school solution. So if you've been around a while, you'll remember Full Send RC. They make brass inserts. They were one of the first companies to come out with some brass for the SCX24. So these slip in the back. They also fit the Trio Type B wheels. So I'll put the weights of both of these on the screen. But you can see this is coming in at like 13.2 without the weights. So with the weights, it puts them heavier than the aluminum wheels up at what, 26 something. So I think that'll be very comparable. And it also allows me to just weight the four on the ground and have a, a, a lighter spare tire, which will be nice. So I think that is the wheels right there. Now for the tires, I do have something new and exciting. These are the brand new uh, RC four wheel drive Falcon Wild Peak MTs. These are in the 2.2 size, so 56 millimeter, I believe by 19. So this is the new Wild Peak tread pattern. So I've got the original Wild Peaks that RC Four Wheel Drive makes. I really like those. I want to say those are more like a 48 to 50 millimeter height. So these are a little bit taller, and of course, just a new tread pattern. That same sticky gummy X2S3 compound. Let's see if this gives any more info on height. Just 2.2 inch tires. But uh, really excited to get these mounted up and run them. The uh, kind of difference than any other RC four wheel drive tire that I've noticed in these was the uh, foams. So these are just super stiff, super dense. Like I feel like these could support their 110 scale trail finder. This is just set up for a lot of weight. Um, and I do have a weighty build, but these are also pretty narrow and these wheels are a little bit wider. So I think I want to just try to fill this tire out just a little bit more and uh, potentially get a little more uh, maybe sidewall give, I don't know. It's just, so I think I'm planning maybe a half of one of these foams. So I've got firms in the rear, mediums for the front because of the weight. So I think I'm gonna get all this stuff mounted up and uh, we'll take a look at what this looks like in its alternate configuration. All right, made a little progress getting some of these mounted. So I've got my spare mounted on the stock foam and uh, it's not as bad as I thought because it's a little shorter than the actual tire and the wheel is wider than the tire and the foam so there's some air gap to the side and there's a little to the top so you get a little bit of uh, compression but the foam itself is just super super stiff but I think uh, in this stock scenario they would still work pretty well you can see that the tire can uh, kind of grab here there's enough flex because of that air gap but uh, these are the two fronts with the mediums and you can see just that sidewall is filled out much better with that half a foam in there and nice support, but still 
plenty of compression there. Plus I'll be able to have firmer in the rear, softer in the front. Um, you can see I've got the wheel weights in here and you can see they're nice and uh, loose. So I'll be able to pop those out if I ever want to remove them. And the way I did that was sanding the outer edge. You can see this one kind of is starting and then it just locks up. So you can press fit that in. Of course, you've got to get it squared up perfectly, but you're probably never getting it out. And you're also going to scratch that inner finish of the wheel. So uh, just a little bit of sanding around that outer edge loosens it up. You can always slip a piece of paper between uh, the weight and the rim as you're mounting it just a little shred and that will tighten it up and keep it from even moving at all. But it, you can see it's not going to fall out, it catches, but I think it's fine uh, when you're, you know, you're going to be using it in this method, not this method. So um, no problem there. I'd rather be able to remove those in the future, be able to flip the rim or whatever, not damage the finish. So. Just a little tip on that. And one thing I forgot to mention on these wheels, the reason that I really love them is the tool that they come with. I use this tool on every build, on every set of wheels. It's one of the thinnest, if not thinnest walled, super narrow tool to get in um, every wheel that I've come into encounter. So um, another thing I didn't mention is the paperclip method to mount these. So it's an easy, easy way to, uh, Put your hub on, put your rim on, and then align your outer face spokes, drop it all together and kind of compress it and get a few screws in to start the wheel. And I'll show a photo of that, kind of all how it's assembled there. But it just makes alignment really easy and it uh, actually gives you something to kind of hold on the back of the wheel as you, you know, align it and compress everything down so to me that makes mounting these up super easy so if you don't know that maybe that's why you don't like these wheels but uh, you can see here i've got this uh, firm set of foams for the rears ready to go cut in half and i do suggest labeling foams if you're using different you know firmness types front and rear it's a good idea so with this record weight on these they compress to about a quarter of their overall width. And then just as comparison, these stock foams, they don't compress at all. So that just shows you those are insanely dense foams. So I'm gonna get these mounted up. We'll have a rear set, I have to sand these, get that uh, mounted in the rim, and then we'll get them on the truck. Here we are with the second set mounted up. And I gotta say, those look pretty good. Freaking black and gray is hard to beat. And the Wild Peaks pair up super nice. Those foams are filling them out. Just looks great. Not too tall, not too small. I think that's gonna be a perfect pairing right there. You can see I've got the full sin weights front and rear. Man, just killer, just killer. So I did get out the original Falcon Wild Peak MT tire. So on this new one, you see it's got siping all across the tread. So this original, basically that's the difference. It's more of the solid lug design of the old style. Um, a lot of new tires are going to more siping, on-road performance. So that's fairly typical to see kind of hybrid MT tires in modern day. But most of the old school stuff was just solid lug um, like that. But both of them a great looking tire, same compound. I've actually got this set up the same with Crawl Innovations and a full send weight, but um, just great, great tires overall. And I think they're gonna work great on the build. So I think now with this second set done, I think it's time to get this guy on the scales and see where we landed overall. Time for the weigh-in. And luckily I've already weighed it with the aluminum rims with and without the battery. So I've got that for comparison. So let's just get it on the scales as is. So we've got no battery obviously in it right now. Let's see where this settles. So it looks like it is gonna be a little bit better front bias with that lighter spare. So it looks like 51.49 and it is overall very heavy. 
702.8. So let's get a battery in and check the weight, but before we do that, I'll show a photo of the aluminum rims without a battery. Okay, this time with battery, and man, that battery added some weight. Let's let those settle out so everything's zeroed. that dropped us back a couple percent points and man that is a heavy battery so we're up at 746.2 so pretty pretty beefy build overall so I'll show the stats with the aluminum rim and the aluminum spare and battery for comparison so overall I think uh, all that weight is down low, hopefully most of it, um, a lot of brass. So hopefully that'll work in the advantage to counteract a lot of that top uh, body weight and spare, kind of keep it planted, but it's definitely not going to be a, a 60, 40 crawler for sure. Okay. We've got just a couple of remaining accessories to go. And this is just too funny. So these are the little packaging inserts for the license plates. And I mentioned earlier just how awesome their uh, packaging was. Well, anyways, this front plate, you can see it's got two mounting holes. It only had one screw in the packaging. And uh, it came with this nice little graphic card and big explanation as to why. And then it had two extra screws. So that's just funny. And uh, it's especially funny since I'm just going to replace them with my own black screws. But uh, anyways, talk about going above and beyond for uh, marketing and graphics, um, just total image. That's just too funny. And so the rear one, I guess I showed earlier, it's a press fit into the rear of the FJ. And then this guy will just screw onto the bumper. So I'm going to go ahead and get those guys installed. Let's take a quick look at the finished install. So these were super easy to install, of course. You can see I've got the blacked out hardware here. So metal on metal connection at this bumper, metal plate holder, so it's not going anywhere. This thing is super secure. And then the rear was a nice secure press fit just into the plastic uh, body. There's a little hole in the door. So I didn't end up using any shoe goo, but again, I don't think that is going anywhere as well. But overall, just uh, super happy with all these little hard body crawler company accessories you can get for it. I think those just kind of give it that little extra bit of detail and take it over the top. I mean, especially this front bumper that really makes the uh, classic FJ look. You just can't really beat that. And it's, uh, it's really nice that they actually give you the spare tire holder in the kit, that that's not an accessory. And uh, probably my favorite thing is this rear bumper. That's just super detailed. The little stainless bumperettes, then you got the lights. The only uh, thing I would like is if they made these four LEDs so you could slip one in the back of the bumper but uh, either way it's still a nice little scale detail touch so I think that wraps up the body I figured it was about time to uh, turn this thing on give it a little test maybe take a look at this underdrive here in the rear but before we do that I want to talk about one more cool little accessory I've got here and you're looking at it in front of you on the table so I've got another one so these are ramp crab. Uh, you heard me right, ramp crab. It's a ramp and a crab. So these are nice little stands here and they accommodate quite a few sizes. So I think all the stock SCX24 links. So you can see the rear axle holder is just slotted there. So you can slide back and forth and then you've got the kind of the front uh, just axle capture point. But what I found that was neat was uh, this metal uh, bar goes basically to the end and you can see the set screw points are pretty far away from the end. So you can actually loosen these and stretch it out just a little more. So if you've got an odd length or you need a little more, you can uh, bring this out maybe four or five more millimeters. But uh, really like this. I've been waiting on a stand to come out that I like. I've seen some that kind of cradle the rear axle, cradle the front, but they're separate pieces. And you know, that's just a lot. That's two things. You've got to 
kind of a line and set it on. This keeps them together and uh, you can just kind of grab the whole stand and move it around. So that's kind of nice. But uh, anyways, enough about the actual stand. I think it's time to uh, turn this on and actually take a look at it. Let me get this body open. Let's see if I can't get this turned on. Alright, let's give this guy a go. So we've got 20% underdrive in the rear. If I can remember that far back in the build. And it looks like it is working. I think this is our third turn on the front. So it'll take about five full turns. Brings it back to normal. So look at that, that is top speed with the uh, slow motion pancake mode. I'm not afraid to pull that trigger. I don't think I ever got the ROP fully, uh, fully trigger pulled. It just had so much juice. Just feels like the wheels would have come off or something. But uh, I think uh, we're ready to get this off the stand and maybe uh, do a little tabletop test. Let's bring on the uh, contestant here. We'll do a nice little creep up these 3D printed ramps. Check out this articulation. Nice, getting that back tire stuffed. Look at that, great fitment there. No problem, look at that. Flex blades keeping all the tires on the ground. Let's reset. We'll take it from this direction. Look at that back tire. Boom, just getting stuffed. I'm really liking doing some of these narrow builds that keep the tires tucked in the body. I think that ends up looking really sweet. Nice slow motion pancake. Oh, I missed the back tire. Let's see if we can get up over it. Sure we can. Look at that. No problem. Let me creep up this guy. That nice little tire squish. Still got the back tire on the ground. Look at that, oh, front tire's coming off just a hair. I gotta say that I'm pretty happy with that articulation and control, for sure. I think this thing is gonna handle quite nicely. All that weight and the oil shocks really feel good on this, really feel like it's planted. So I think that may do it there for the the testing feels like everything works. Servo is super quick at 8.4. Look at that. Boom. All right. So enough playing around. Here we are at the end of another build. And of course, you knew I was going to do it. If I've got scale plate holders on the build, you know I'm going to get some scale plates on there. So I worked a little magic. Use a little shoe goo and got those mounted to the plate holders and I think they ended up looking really good. They are 1 16th scale, so a little bit larger than I use. And uh, if you haven't picked up on the theme of this build, those probably clue you in a little bit more, but uh, I think that was a nice little finishing touch. And speaking of finishing touches, I got some scale hubs for this set of rims. And these are in Jura and they're so small and the way they're printed, they end up looking like uh, locking hubs from a distance. So I think those look really good. Had to have some scale hubs on these since these have such nice ones, but uh, I think those, two little details 
fully complete this guy and I gotta say I am just blown away with it. The uh, Grizzly Works Toyota Grill just pushes it right over the top and the custom paint job I just really couldn't be happier with. I think that came out great. The first build I've ever done with body pins but I love the system that they are actually hidden. They don't scratch the uh, exterior when you're putting them on and off but man just such a unique build. Really happy with all the hard body crawler company parts and accessories for this. All of those were just flawless attention to detail, just super scale. So I've got that other body, as I mentioned, minus one mirror. So I'm definitely gonna paint up another option and hopefully find something that may work a little bit better with these kind of metallic brown. Although I still think they look pretty good against this gray. Gray and black's pretty neutral. So uh, I think that works pretty well. But anyways, both sets of tires, I think, are a good uh, fit for this. Both very scale, kind of not too large. So all that's really left for me to do is actually get this out on a course and give it a little uh, true run, true test. But uh, as always, I appreciate you coming along on the build with me. Hope you learned something. Sorry about the uh, three motor swaps, but I think we landed on a good one for the build overall. But uh, definitely stay tuned for what's coming down the pipe. But I think until next time, thanks for watching.